can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so, um, as, as uh, April said, I'm going to talk mostly about California sea lions. We have a research program that actually works on lots of seals and sea lion species in the Channel Islands. But um, California sea lions, for many reasons, um, have kind of taken the spotlight of our work, primarily because they've been identified as sentinels of ocean health. And I'll talk about what that means as I get further along. Um, how many of you have seen California sea lions in the wild? Um, well, that was not always the case. California were not always as abundant as they are now. Um, they were heavily harvested by um, Indians long ago and, um, and by early Europeans in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But they became protected, as did all marine mammals, by federal law, the, National, uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which was passed in 1972. And that afforded blanket protection, really, to all marine mammals. Um, no taking was allowed of any kind. Um, it's a very unique piece of legislation in that it, it really was something that um, pretty much stopped everything and allowed the populations just to recover. Okay. And it, uh, oh, there we go. Woo. Okay. And, it, oops. How's that? There we go. Um, and so through that legislation, they, uh, they, along with many other species, started increasing. Um, and we spend most of our time, our job as uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service is to monitor the recovery of those populations under that act. Um, and now the population of California sea lions went from about 48,000 um, in 1972 before they were really protected to more than 290,000 in 2007 was the last estimate. So a very successful story um, for the population in general. And that's true for a lot of species um, here along the west coast and up into Alaska. So this is our research station. It's located at the west end of San Miguel Island at Point Bennett. Um, it's kind of up on a hilltop, and the animals are down below us. Our research focuses primarily on monitoring the population growth of all the pinniped species there. But our detailed research and our very focused studies have been on California sea lions and northern fur seals. We also try to understand things that are affecting the population trends. So once we start, we do a lot of counting. Um, but as those populations fluctuate, we want to know why they're fluctuating, um, particularly to try to keep the population healthy. It's important to know what the problems are. So these are the things that we focus on. Um, competition for space and food, both between and among the species using San Miguel. Environmental changes. Um, probably a lot of you are familiar with El Nino. Um, but also longer scale events like decadal oscillations. Um, climate change is a real big topic right now. But there are also these small regional um, anomalies that seem to be occurring, particularly off the California coast and Oregon, Washington, that are kind of a relatively new phenomenon in the California current. And those can have a pa impact similar to an El Nino. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Disease is a pretty recent um, topic that we've been focusing a lot on. Um, Democ acid, which you may all be somewhat familiar with being here on the coast, has been a big subject of research in the last two decades. Uh, it does have a pretty big impact on California sea lions because it targets adult females and juveniles. And parasites, primarily hookworms, um, have been a very major disease. Sometimes, whoops, I'm losing my voice here. From about 2000, um, uh, actually earlier than that, probably the late 1990s, uh, up until 2007 or 8, um, hookworms were playing a pretty important role in, in mortality of pups. And finally, human um, This includes things like contaminants that come into the environment from runoff of coastal streams and rivers. These are, this is a very coastal species, um, so they're um, affected by sewage runoff and other things that might be coming into the environment from our agricultural activities and other things that we do along the coast. Um, there's also pathogens in sewage, of course, and, and um, you know, cleaning supplies and other things that end up in our water. And then finally, fishery interactions, which is direct interactions of California sea lions with commercial fisheries. And sport fisheries, too, but commercial fisheries. So what's so special about San Miguel Island and why are our pinnipeds, which are the seals and sea lions, so fond of it as a place to live? 
California Current. It extends from uh, can the Canada-U.S. border up here near Vancouver Island and all the way down to offshore islands off Baja, California, Mexico. It's an extremely productive um, upwelling current, um, and that's what this, this slight shading indicates, that it's an upwelling current. Um, and that means that it's, it supports a tremendous amount of bioproductivity. And San Miguel Island, see right here, is located this, this cold here indicates upwelling activity along the California coast. You might recognize Point Conception here. Here we are in Ventura. And San Miguel right here um, is right at this sort of break when the current, when the California current comes around Point Conception, it kind of comes right along the outside of San Miguel Island. And that makes foraging resources very close to the island for, for the pinniped species using it. It also keeps the temperatures fairly cold and makes it difficult for visitors to come there. So more about San Miguel. Oh. I'm the guinea pig, apparently, for all this, this new technology. Oh, OK. That was in uh, Monterey Bay. Mm -hmm. I'll get back to that a little bit later. So this is, uh, this is San Miguel Island from, from Google Earth, um, our research station. Oops, our research station. Oh, oh, sorry. Hold on, hold on. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is um, this is the west end that I was talking about. Our research station is located up here on this cliff. And the interesting thing is that almost 50% of the pinnipeds that are at San Miguel Island breed on this little tiny sand area here. They are now also found as the populations increase all over the island. Um, but this is where most of our really intensive research has taken place because that has historically been where the population is most dense. Um, as I said, it's located near the productive waters of the California Current. That makes it easy for females to get food for their pups. And when the pups are weaned at about a year old, there's lots of food nearby for them to figure out how to eat. Um, it supports six, six species of pinnipeds. It's the only place in the world where there are six species of pinnipeds using the same habitat land breeding pinnipeds. So it's really amazing for that reason. It also is the only place in the world that has the largest concentration of land breeding pinnipeds. So it's right outside your back door, so you need to try to get there. Um, cold ambient temperatures year round um, provide a predictable um, food source, and there's no predators and no humans anymore. So that makes it a great place for them to give birth and, um, and raise their young. Here are the resident uh, pinnipeds. Um, we start with the Pacific Harbor seal up here. Um, this is a female with a pup. There's about 3,000 uh, for the population at San Miguel Island. Um, they've been pretty stable, but it's, it's the smallest of all the populations. They tend to like so some of the more isolated coves and coastal areas, and they like to kind of be away from all the other, the other species. Northern fur seals, uh, this represents the southern extreme of their breeding range at San Miguel Island. Most of the population breeds in Alaska, um, but we have a small population there that was founded in 1968, and it's about 12,000 animals. Um, our northern elephant seals are a fairly large population of about 50,000, um, and this here is a bull, and there's a female back here and some pups tucked in there. Oh, and this, I didn't really explain this. This is an adult male, uh, northern fur seal, and here's a group of females that are associated with him and some pups. And then the one we're going to star of our show today, California sea lions. Um, this is a male and a female and some pups here in the foreground, about 122,000 at our most recent estimate at San Miguel Island. So they're by far the largest population. And here are the visitors. This makes up the six species. The Guadalupe fur seal um, and the northern or stellar sea lion. Guadalupe fur seals were thought to be extinct um, until the 1960s when somebody found a few of them in a cave down by Guadalupe Island, which is their primary breeding area. And they became protected under Mexican and U.S. law, and now the population is estimated at about 7,000. Um, and we see them frequently at San Miguel Island. They come and visit. We had a pup born there in 1997. Um, and probably see maybe one animal to two animals um, a year. They're also at San Nicolas and some of the other Channel Islands. The northern stellar sea lion um, is, was a resident of San Miguel until the early 1980s. 
they crashed. They disappeared, actually, from there for unknown reasons, although probably associated with that big El Nino in 82 and 83. They were kind of a small population anyway. But it also coincided with a huge crash of the population in Alaska, which some of you may be familiar with. And, um, and they really haven't um, recolonized it until last year when we saw a couple males at San Miguel. So we're hoping that means they're starting to make their way back down um, south. But today I'm going to talk about California sea lions. And uh, so what's so special about them and why are they, why are they been chosen as this indicator of ecosystem health for the California current? Well, there's lots of things we do as biologists um, trying to understand these complex systems. And one of our classic things is to try to find a species that kind of, if we understand what's happening to it, we can kind of understand what's happening to everything else. And because California sea lions are a top predator in the, cis in the California current and their range is event is eventually encompasses the California current, they're coastal, they're, they're abundant, we can see them at any time of year, that allows us to have a lot of access to them and we can kind of keep track of what's going on with the population. They also eat what we eat, although they eat it raw, but they do eat sardines and squid and a lot of our commercial exports. Um, so if we start seeing a problem with, with um, their food chain and what's in their food chain, that might mean something for human health as well. So that's another reason why they're important. They also, surprisingly, are very sensitive to even small changes in their ocean environment. So if just a small warm, usually mainly warming seems to be the biggest issue for them, but as, uh, as small as a degree increase in sea surface temperature can cause a dramatic change in the food, the structure of the food web, and that can cause um, severe mortality for California sea lions. Um, so it's, they're, they're kind of nice in terms of all this interest in climate change. They're a species that we think will be very sensitive to that over time. They also are susceptible to diseases. Contaminants, both of these um, cause them uh, usually to have lower survival and different age classes and sexes, and also um, reproductive failure in the case of contaminants, and some diseases can cause that as well. And some of these diseases um, are, have now been linked back to human diseases, so they weren't in the population. They weren't endemic to the population. They've come from human sources. But then a lot of the diseases are endemic as well, and they're just finding their way into the population now as it increases. Some of them are density dependent, so as the population has grown, the disease has become a bigger factor. And I'm going to talk about all these things now as we go into more detail. So for all these reasons, they are um, indicators of ecosystem health. And in 2000, um, NOAA began its uh, ocean and human health initiative, and California sea lions were um, identified as the sentinels of ocean health. So that's why a lot of our research now has been oriented toward um, particularly diseases, but, um, but kind of looking at them as this indicator. So first I'm going to give you a little background, a little life history. California sea lions, I said earlier that they, uh, whoops, sorry, there I go again, uh, that they range from throughout the California current, so from uh, the northern part of Vancouver Island here in Canada all the way down to the offshore islands of Baja California and Mexico. They're breeding, they only breed on isolated offshore islands, which are indicated here by the red circles in the Gulf of California, a few islands on the offshore um, west side of Baja California, and then here in the California Channel Islands. Um, females are residents um, from Monterey Bay southward throughout the year with their pups. Um, and males and juveniles and females that don't have pups will be more migratory and often will occur in that northern part of the range. Um, they all descend upon the colonies from May to August, so that's their breeding season. And then in August, the migratory animals will leave and it remains just, just the females and pups remain on the island. So the population drops significantly in the winter months. These are the Channel Islands. Um, California sea lions breed on two of the park islands. Uh, San Miguel Island is about 45% of the U.S. population and 5% at Santa Barbara Island. The other two islands, San Nicolas and San Clemente, are military owned, and those make up the rest of the U.S. breeding population. Um, you can see that San Miguel and San Nicolas together make up 90% of the population. So by monitoring San Miguel Island, we feel like we're getting a pretty good feel for what's going on throughout um, the whole population. It's a little difficult to try to study them at all at all those places. 
California sea lions are polygonous in their breeding system, as are all um, pinnipeds. The male is, uh, this gives rise to sexual dimorphism between the adult male and the females. The adult male here is, is indicated by his chestnut color. They have a little top knot on their head that is usually really blonde by the time they're adult males. And then the females are these blonde, sleek animals. Um, a male will weigh about 1,000 pounds when he's territorial. Females about 250. So a pretty big size difference. And then here in the foreground are the pups. Um, they're born black and about 12 pounds or so. And then they turn kind of to a brownish color as they get older. The annual life cycle, um, I'm just going to talk about females and pups here because the males basically are migratory. And I'll talk a little bit more about them later. Um, but in terms of a life history cycle, it's pretty intense for females. Um, they give. They give birth um, over a six-week period to a single pup um, between June, usually late May, through the end of June, over a six-week period there. That's followed by breeding, um, which takes place from about 30 days postpartum. So once a female gives birth, 30 days later, she's bred. So that's, that spans from mid-June to the end of July. And then they have gestation um, from October through the, for about nine months until the next breeding season. Lactation uh, takes place from birth, um, that's in the purple here, and that goes um, for almost 11 months in a normal year. So females are pretty busy. Once they give birth, um, they're either lactating, and they only have this slight little break um, between, where they sort of have a break between gestation and lactation, but otherwise they're trying to do both. For the pups, they're completely dependent on their mother um, for the first six months of life, so milk only, basically. And then uh, starting in about February, they'll start taking some, some little euphosids and things that they can putz around with out in the ocean. And some of them will be weaned that early, particularly in a good year. Um, but most of it takes place, most of the weaning will take place um, here in April and May over about a month period. And one thing I didn't say up here about the females is that during the lactation period, they make foraging trips. So they go out to sea for two to three days and then they return back to land and nurse their pup for one to two days ashore. And while the female's gone feeding, the pup is fasting ashore. So there's a real limitation in how far a female can go and how long she can stay out um, before her pup will actually start starving. So that's a real important um, part of their life history when it comes to environmental change, because if prey becomes less available or it's further away, it means that they don't have access to it anymore if they still have a pup and they can't migrate because the pups don't travel with them. Okay, so now I'm just going to give you some more details about each of the age classes. These are some pups, very curious pups. Um, they're depend as I said, they're dependent on their mother um, for up to six months. They begin swimming at about eight weeks old, so they're fairly um, helpless for the first eight weeks of their life. They just kind of follow their mother around. Um, and they actually are sometimes taught to swim by their mother. So the mother will take them out into the water like a dog does by the scuff. She'll pull them out and then basically lets them kind of flounder um, and she'll come up underneath them to let them float um, on her back when they need a rest. And then she goes out from under them again and they flay, flail around. And this goes on for a while until they get the hang of kind of using their four flippers. And then they become pretty proficient at swimming um, within the time they're about four months or so. They begin feeding, as I said, six to seven months, but they're still nursing during that time, so they're supplementing their diet. They wean at about 11 months old. Pup survival can be as low as 35% in an El Nino year or when there's disease in the population. Uh, it can be as high as 70%, like in a year like this last one, which is La Nina, which is very good for females and tends to be very good for pups as well. Um, the causes of mortality are primarily starvation. Um, when, the, when something happens to the female, if she dies, um, there's no adoption, so, so if, a, if a pup's mother dies, they're on their own. And, uh, and disease can mainly be hookworm, which I'll talk about later, but it can also be some other things that they get um, just from their environment. And they can also die from trauma. Sometimes they'll get bitten or stomped on by another male or, or a female. So once they make it through that first year, it's a trying time for those pups. But these juveniles, they have a good time. Um, and they have pretty good survival. About 60 to 80% um, will survive their first year once they're weaned. And if they make it to age two, um, then it's about 95% um, throughout the rest of their life. So 
really it's that trying, those trying years, pups and juveniles, much like people in a way, um, that really determine their survival in the long term. Their primary causes of mortality are predation, um, particularly in the northern part of the range where they run into great whites and killer whales. Um, interactions with humans, mainly in terms of fisheries, and then again, diseases. The adult females, once they become an adult female and they're reproductive, things get really serious. They don't have much time to goof around. Um, once they become reproductive at four or five years of age, most of them will give birth every year. Um, some of them will skip a year here and there, uh, or their pup might die. But for the most part, it's a pretty intensive process of reproduction. Um, all of the females are reproducing by age seven. About 77% in a given year will give birth. Um, they give birth to a single pup. As I said, no adoption. Um, they establish recognition of their pup both by vocalizations and by scent. And this is a really critical part of their life history. When females give birth, they separate themselves um, from all the other animals. And they spend about 24 to 48 hours in constant association with their pup. And they call back and forth. The pup calls, and it has a unique vocalization. And the female has a unique vocalization. And they call back and forth so that they can establish a recognition. And then they also have scent recognition. So the female, particularly when she first gives birth, she'll often lick the pup and put her face and her mouth over the top of the pup, getting it scent. The pup will do the same thing with the female. After about 48 hours, that bond is established, and it is unbreakable. Uh, they, once they have that, it is, it is really solid. And the only time we really see a problem is for a young female. The first time she gives birth, sometimes when she goes out on her first foraging trip, when she returns, she's not always that good at finding her pup because, after all, she's trying to find it in a sea of, you know, 500, and they all look the same. So sometimes that can be a challenge. A female comes ashore, she starts calling, and three or 10 or 20 pups will run to her. Um, and then she has to sniff each one until she finds the hers. And if none of them are hers, she'll just keep walking and calling. It's basically like an echolocation on land. And they will, if you watch them, they actually are triangulating as they move through the colony looking for their pup. And sometimes their pup is just sleeping, and they'll finally go and give up for a little while, and then they'll start up again calling until they find it. The lifespan of females is basically unknown. We're still working on that. I thought it would be, you know, a little shorter. So I've been working on them 25 years, and they're still alive. So I think, I think I've got a few more years, probably. I'm hoping it's not going to be like 40 or 50 or something. <laughs> but, but anyway, at this point, um, we think they live to at least 25, possibly longer. And then the adult males. This has been uh, a really kind of surprising uh, part of our work. We, we focus on females mostly because in these species being polygonous, it's the females that really drive the population uh, growth, and that's what we're mostly interested in in terms of determining the health of the population. But the males do contribute half the genetic material, and, um, and it turns out they're really quite interesting. Once we started uh, getting a lot of our, our marked males started showing up as territorial, and all of a sudden I got pretty enamored with them. Um, you can see they're charming, oops, I forgot here, um, charming here with, uh, this is a big territorial male with a pup laying on his back, um, and these are his females here, he's holding a territory in this area. They're very gentle with the pups, um, they'll let them pull their whiskers and their ears and climb all over them, um, they really don't show any aggression at all toward the pups, and it's, and it's pretty unique actually for pinnipeds, a lot of the male pinnipeds are pretty uh, they don't want to be bothered with the pups, and if the pups harass them, they'll bite them or throw them. Or, um, but these guys are, are gentle giants in a way. They can reproduce at four or five years. Most of them don't, and that's because they have to develop both a physical and a social maturity before they can actually breed with a female. Um, the physical maturity involves bulking up to about 1,000 pounds. Uh, most of that mass is here in their chest, and this is developed for fighting, so that when they're bitten in their chest, they have a hard... Uh, a hard sort of surface there, and it, they don't tend to be lethal fights. Um, but it's this kind of bulking up here that makes them sustain the fighting. They develop this sagittal caress, which is what we call a secondary sexual characteristic, um, which indicates to females, basically, that they're, that they're adults. And apparently it's an attractive trait. Uh, social maturity is probably the bigger component of this, because a, a male can have these physical attributes but if he doesn't um, show aggressiveness to fight and communicate well with the females, he won't get any copulations. Um, and it's a really interesting part of their life history in that the females do a lot of the choosing. 
So although the males set up territories and they actually have females around them, the females, because they breed 30 days after they give birth and they've gone out on foraging trips and back and forth, they can actually choose any male they want to be bred. So just because he's holding territory here and protecting her pup doesn't mean that she's going to breed with him. So part of their maturity and their access to females has to do with social maturity and learning how to interact with females in a way that will entice a female to breed with them. And we're working a lot on this now. I'm doing a lot of um, sort of, this has been kind of a relatively new thing that we're seeing, and we're trying to understand it a little bit better. But it's, it's pretty interesting. This is the only species of pinniped that has that kind of complexity. About 10% of the males that are born will survive to reproductive age. So not a very high number, and even a smaller number of those will actually be territorial. So um, when we have a lot of the interactions that we have along the coast up in the northwest where you guys hear about, you know, them interacting with, uh, with uh, fisheries and things, um, we often can do management action on males because there, there are so many of them in the population and only a few of them actually are contributing. So a lot of them are actually what we call excess males in the population that actually will never breed. And it's because they don't have one of these characteristics. They're either not bulky enough, um, they're not aggressive enough, or they never learned the social skills. So a little more on males. Um, this is a typical um, layout of a territory in the middle of the breeding season. And you can see there's kind of a pattern here, or I can see it, hopefully you will too. Um, it's a parallel, we call it a parallel system, where the males basically line up in a parallel kind of way along the beach crest. So what basically happens is you end up with these kind of areas where there are territories. And the males are spread out kind of along here. And these males down here, we consider sort of the prime males because they have access to water. And that's a really critical, especially at San Miguel, because it can get quite hot. Females, when they're ready to be bred, they want to be cool, and they like to go down into the surf zone. So most of these males um, get more access to females for breeding. And then as you kind of move inland, you get your lesser experienced and lower quality males. But these guys do still get some copulation. This guy's got a nice territory here. Um, and he probably gets a few, you know, a few breedings. Um, but this is where you want to be if you're a male. Yeah, you want to be water. OK, so that's the life history part. Um, so how do we monitor population growth and, and health of sea lions? I mean, it's a big population. They have a huge expanse. And so we just basically have what we call indexes. And one of them is the annual counts of live and dead pups, which provide just a trend. We just kind of keep track of how many pups are born every year and how many die. And that gives us a pretty good feel for whether the population is going up or down. And then we have this marking program, which I kind of alluded to when I was talking about all of that life history information. The reason we know all of that is because we brand California sea lions when they're four to five months old. It's a permanent mark on their left shoulder. And basically, from that mark, it, it marks them for their entire life. And so we don't ever have to touch them again or uh, disturb them again. We can get all the information we need from, um, from afar. And uh, we spend a lot of time in blinds and hiking around cliffs, um, keeping track of them. And most of those animals, I know their entire life history. I know how many pups they had, you know, when they had them, who they bred with. Um, that's kind of what the, the marking allows us to do. It's a critical part of determining how many animals are in the population. It also helps us understand patterns and the trends by knowing what's happening with survival and reproduction and, we, and how those things, how those parameters vary with age and sex. Um, environmental changes, they can have a pretty big influence on different age and sex groups. Diseases, same thing. Um, and human interactions, um, as we talked about. So we're going to go through all those one at a time here. Oh, first, I'm going to tell you how many there are, because that's what everyone always wants to know. How many are there? Um, so um, this is a live pup count. We do this every year. We go out and literally count every pup on San Miguel. Well, we really don't see them all. We estimate, but, but we see a lot of them. And uh, this is on the, oops, oh, well, I'm going to do this part, I guess, now, too. Um, you can see these big dips here in the population. Those are El Niños. And you can s so you can see how, how we can actually use this to, to know that something's going on in the population. And then here, this big, this big dip here, which is sort of a surprise, not associated with an El Nino, really, or a strong one, um, but in fact, a, a regional um, collapse in upwelling that occurred between Monterey Bay and Point Conception in 2009 caused a huge mortality of pups. 
And on top of that, in 2010, females um, didn't produce because in 2009 they couldn't find enough food to support lactation and reproduction. And so we had two years of really, really low um, survival in the first, in 2009, of pups, and then in the second one, uh, just very low production in general. But you can see that in 2011, they jumped back up to 26,000. So um, they recovered pretty nicely. This is a pup that we've branded. Um, you can see here he's V101. This is his little brand. We also tag them, and this is mainly so that if they're found on a beach or somebody sees them um, or they're caught in a net or whatever, and w the brand can't be determined, we can still find out the fate of the animal by the tag. This is, a, this is not a dead pup back here. It's actually alive, but it's, it's kind of rolling around back there. I couldn't really get it out of the photo. Um, okay, so then this is, uh, so from these marked animals, this is a marked pup, we get pup survival from that. We basically go down there and we, we look for them every year and by, by the history that we create of a year that we see them and a year that we don't, we can actually determine the probability that that pup is actually alive in any given year. And so we create graphs that look like this. Um, this is uh, for, for, so we've been branding since 1987 um, all the way up until the present. And these data go through the 2008 cohort. Um, and you can see here we started, this is, um, we really couldn't do much with the first couple of years because we didn't do very many. We were kind of just testing out the method. But starting in 1989, um, you can kind of see the variability here in pup survival. I mean, it kind of bounces all around. See the really bad years here, um, which are El Nino's. And you can see there's also kind of a period here, kind of a couple years, um, where we had um, some lower survival, and that was due to hookworm. Yearling survival is then um, after they've passed their first birthday. It's another big, um, really important milestone for them. So we keep track of that survival as well. And you can see the pattern is slightly different from the pups. But again, you see the impact of El Nino's here. Here's the 97, 98, which was a really big one. And it caused um, a lower survival of, of juveniles as well as pups. Also in these, I didn't point that out, but you can see that the females and males, females are in dark gray and the males are the lighter bars. Um, there is a slight difference between males and females in terms of survival. Generally, females have higher survival than the males, even, even as pups. And that carries through all the way through their life. And um, just to, oh, this was just to point out those years that are, that kind of stand out as being different kinds of um, events. And this is survival for animals that are two years or older. It turns out that once they hit two years old, basically their survival is pretty stable all the way until they hit about 17 or so, or 15 actually, I guess here you can see the start of a decline. Um, in the males, particularly, it's, at it's about at 14. At the females, a little bit lighter at 15. Um, but you can see that they're, it's pretty stable there um, in, those, in those younger age groups. And this, these are what we call the prime age groups. These are the breeders, so they're the ones doing most of the reproduction. And then, as I said, it's, uh, the, it's for, our, uh, for our survival and reproduction, so here's the reproductive part of that from our marked up here is a, this is a branded female. I guess it's probably hard to see that. Um, she's, in this picture, she's, um, she's nine years old, and this is her pup from that year. And this is uh, just to show you the difference in El Nino and normal um, in reproductive rates. Normally, 77% of the females will give birth in an El Nino for this age group, 4 to 16. Um, in an El Nino year, that drops to about 58% of them. And in this older age group, 17 to 21, um, we have overall a lower reproductive rate just in general, but then it drops even more um, in an El Nino. And we think that's because by the time a female is 17 years old, She's had a lot of pups in her lifetime, and it's a very energetically expensive uh, process of reproducing. And so when things get bad and you've been producing that much over your lifetime, you just can't pull it off um, as you get older. So how many are there? Okay, so from the data I just showed you, we basically um, use the survival rates and the birth rates, and we determine that, in fact, for every pup that's born, there's about 3.1 female non-pups in the population and 1.6 male pups. So we multiply that times our, our pup count, which is an even sex ratio, one to one, 26,000. So we get, for 2011, about 122,200 pups. And the U.S. population in 2007, as I said when I started the talk, 290,000. 
So what affects population growth? Everyone's always saying, wow, there's an awful lot of sea lions out there. Um, well, there's natural regulators, um, competition for resources, oceanographic events, diseases, and predation. Um, there's human interactions, um, contaminants, and fisheries. Um, competition for resources. Um, this is, as I said, populations at San Miguel are unique in that they share the same space. So there's potential there for competition among the different species. So we've been kind of studying that for many years. We don't really see a big sign of it, partially because you can see here, um, they're sort of color-coded. This is an adult sea lion male with his females. Here's a northern fur seal with his females. And then here's an elephant seal who's just trying to molt, but he happens to be in the middle of all this. And so they all hang out on this beach, and everybody has to find kind of their space. But they manage to do it um, very well and with relatively little um, interaction. So that doesn't seem to be an issue. We think the bigger issue is competition um, for food, mainly between, um, I'm not going to go through this whole slide for you, but, but um, California sea lions and northern fur seals, because they have a similar range and they eat the same things, um, they're the most likely competitors. But the good thing is that fur seals are only there from May to November, so they're not competing with sea lions year-round. They also tend to be a little bit further offshore and less coastal than California sea lions. So we think the bigger issue, and these other species really don't overlap all that much with anything. They kind of have their own period when they're breeding, and they don't really get in each other's way. Um, we think the competition for food is going to be a bigger issue within the species. So California sea lions competing with California sea lions as the population increases. Oceanographic events, uh, El Nino being the big one, but all these other little things that seem to occur over time. Um, during these events, usually what happens is the California current weakens. That causes a decrease in upwelling. That leads to a warming sea surface temperature, which then leads to a decline in productivity in the surface layers. So we see a decline in phytoplankton production, then zooplankton, then small fishes, then big fishes, and then sea lions. Um, these El Nino events uh, occur every five to seven years in the California current. They can be a varying intensity, varying duration. You guys probably know most of that. Um, and, but they can last for one to two years, so their effects can actually be prolonged. But generally, it's a temporary effect in the population. So it might cause low pup production for a couple of years, but most of the time the events do not cause adult mortality. So the population kind of bounces back after a couple of years. Other events that last only a few months can have a similar effect. In 2009, uh, that event only lasted for about three months. Um, it was mainly from Point Conception to San Miguel, or Point, Con Point Conception to Monterey Bay, sorry. And uh, it basically caused that, that uh, we saw that big drop in the, in the pup graph that I showed you. Um, it had a huge effect on the population. Um, and yet it was this really short, pulsed event. So, so it doesn't have to be some big thing. It can actually be something very small. And they just pick it up in terms of availability of food. And it can really have devastating effects. And as I uh, started on this, I guess, um, impacts of the events on growth will depend on the intensity of the event, uh, the timing relative to reproduction and weaning. If the event in 2009 had happened in December or January when pups were about six months old, probably wouldn't have had that much of an impact. Um, but it was mainly because it happened right at breeding in June, May and June, and females couldn't find food to support their pups or to have enough energy to, to breed. And this is more specific, um, just kind of following on that, I guess, what it causes, the, this change in, in availability of prey kind of causes a change in foraging behavior. Females have to travel farther usually. They tend to stay out longer on foraging trips, and that means the pup has to fast longer. And so that leads to starvation. Um, juveniles um, and adults can, can affect their survival. The 82, 83 event, which was a very big El Nino, that did cause adult female um, mortality as well as juveniles. So the population took almost seven years to recover from that. Um, whereas in the events that we had, like in 97, 98, that was a big deal, but it really only impacted pups. The females managed to get through it, and so the population recovered pretty quickly afterwards. Um, it results in decreased reproduction, as we talked about. It can also result in decreased growth of pups. So sometimes if the pups survive, they just tend to be smaller. And then we see that as, the pop as they move through their life, the cohort will often stay smaller. Um, they'll also be um, lower reproductive output. So they just never kind of catch up. They can, they can actually be permanently sort of stunted um, from those events. 
And this is just to show you um, how their distribution can change in an El Nino. 1993, which was an El Nino year, is in red here. These are adult female, just sort of distributions from geolocation recorders we had out, or sorry, satellite recorders we had out. 1996 is here in yellow. That was a very cold year and very productive year. And you can see that, that there's kind of a, in the El Nino year, with the red, they're much further, further, kind of further north, further offshore. There's some of the yellow, but look at how concentrated the yellow is close to the island compared to in the El Nino where they've got this wider spread. That's just a, an indication of, of dispersion of prey and females having to go farther, stay out longer to find it. Disease, uh, as I said, hookworm. Um, the interesting thing about it is it only affects pups, um, so it, it operates kind of only one age class. Demoic acid um, affects mostly adult and juvenile females, so that can have a, a bigger impact on the population. This is the hookworm life cycle. They're very clever parasites. Um, they actually are, um, in their larval stage, they're in the sand, and then they mature into a third stage larva, we call it, and then they push their way up through the skin and the flippers, and they move through the body into the blubber, and they hang out there in the males forever because they don't ever have pups, so it's a dead end in a male. But in the females, when she becomes reproductive, the, and each year that she's going to have a pup, as she gets ready for reproduction, the mammary glands fill, the hookworms move, the larvae move down into the mammary tissue, and then when the pup suckles for the first time, it gets a load of hookworm larvae. And then those mature in the intestine of the pup, they hook on, basically, which is why they're called hookworms, um, and they consume um, blood and nutrients from the intestines of the pup. And then when the hookworms, uh, while they're in the intestines, they actually, they actually deliver their eggs, and so the eggs go back into the sand and start to cycle all over again. Uh, and this is why it's only the pups that die, because the, the hookworm actually will, will sort of um, cause, their, cause them basically to have organ failure from, from um, anemia. So that's, that's why it doesn't affect the females. She's fine. She's just offloading it every year to, to a new pup. And she keeps getting reinfected because, because the worms keep moving through the sand. This is a hookworm, uh, <laughs> a micrograph of a hookworm. Ah, I thought you'd like that. Um, so they're infected, as I said, with the first milk. Um, the infections in California sea lions can last for six to ten months, so it's a very long infection period. Some of the pups will die within weeks, uh, well, six to eight weeks after getting infected if it's a really bad infection. Some of them can actually live for six to ten months, and some of the pups will actually have an infection but manage to clear it and survive. Um, and what we think is happening now, because hookworm was a very big mortality cause in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, and we were seeing mortality um, up close to 50 to 60 percent from the disease, and that has now suddenly stopped. And we think basically that, that it's now, it's been in the population probably for four to five generations, and we think that the animals that are now reproducing um, have immunity basically to, to the worm, and so they're not, they're not having the impact they once had. Um, what kills them mostly, the anemia is the beginning of it, but then the hookworms actually puncture through the intestinal wall, and the bacteria that are in your gut get out into the body and then cause infections, and that's what actually kills the pups. Um, this is a density-dependent parasite, so as the population grows, it becomes more abundant, and if the population declines, it'll become less prevalent. And to the point where in the Pribilof Islands, for northern fur seals, they had a huge outbreak of hookworm in the 60s and early 70s, and now there are no hookworms to be found, and the population up there has, has declined substantially over that time period. So they, they are definitely something that, that controls population growth. And demoic acid. Uh, this is a neurotoxin that's produced by Pseudonychia australis, which is a little kind of diatom-type thing. Um, it attacks the nervous system and leads to seizures, for mainly for adult females and juveniles and brain damage that eventually can lead to death. The events are becoming more frequent, or at least we're identifying them. We don't know that they weren't occurring prior to the, to the last couple of decades, but now we're actually pretty good at, at finding them in the environment, knowing that they're starting and how long they last. As many as 3,000 animals can die in a single event. Um, some of the events really vary in how long they last and how intense they are and what region they're in. Um, they're not always in the same area, so they don't always overlap with sea lions. 
on average, 74% uh, of the mortality is adult female. So that's why it can have a really dramatic impact on the population if it were to be something that occurred, say, every year and was killing 3,000 animals it would have a really, it would quickly impact the population because you're taking out your reproductive component, all your adult females. Sublethal doses also have an effect. Um, they cause reproductive failure. So females that contract amoic acid when they're pregnant um, often will have premature births. And a more recent thing, you might ask, with all these sea lions, you know, and all, well, actually, six pinniped species, right? Lots of food, you'd think, and you'd think there'd be a predator right, out there eating all this stuff. But no, we've not seen any indication of that in all the years we've been working there. They do have great white shark predation and killer whales up north, but not at San Miguel until this year. And in 2010, uh, starting this winter, we started seeing these marks on a lot of the females um, and a lot of the juveniles that were hanging out around the island through the winter and then into the summer. A lot of the wounds were fresh, so we knew that they were occurring close to the island. And so we talked to some shark biologists, and they say that they think they're either juvenile great white sharks or mako sharks. And we don't know yet whether this is going to be a new, you know, uh, regulator in the population. It's going to be a, a permanent thing, or whether it's just a phenomenon where the sharks are here this year for some reason because the environment is good for them and they disappear next year. We just don't know yet. Um, but definitely because of the age classes they're targeting, the females and the juveniles, if it were to continue at the level that we saw it this year, it could potentially have an impact over time. We, we saw more than 100 um, um, scarred animals. So we figure those are the survivors. So we know that there's at least that many that probably died and maybe more. And then fishery interactions. Um, this is the human component, really. Um, probably the number one mortality relative to humans. They die both by getting entangled in, in gillnet, usually because they're pursuing the prey that they're trying to catch or fish that are going after the fish that are in the net. Um, they also end up um, either, sometimes they're cut out of the nets because um, fishermen don't want to handle them, which is understandable when they're a big animal. Um, they also can, out of just curiosity, if there's ghost net floating, they'll go up into it and get it around their neck. Um, this is a... This hasn't really been monitored very well. In the 1980s, they estimated about 5,000 animals were dying in gillnet fisheries in the California Bight. We don't have any recent estimates because we don't have observers in those fisheries any longer um, monitoring it. Um, and for a long time, the state of California has a moratorium on gillnetting, you know, different kinds of regulations to sort of um, protect different resources from gillnetting close to the islands. And we saw a drop in it in the 90s um, and into the early 2000s, um, partially because of some of that legislation that was passed in the 80s and the early 90s. But this year, in 2010, for some reason, um, we saw a big jump in the number of entangled, particularly juveniles, um, which is what we call, this is an entanglement. Um, and we don't understand that. So we're sort of looking into it now and trying to understand whether the animals have now moved such that they're coming into contact again with fisheries. Um, or whether something else has changed about that, that interaction between the two. And then human interactions in another form. Um, as California sea lions uh, grow in population, they show up in very unusual places. Um, and it's sort of interesting. I mean, this, this here, some of you might recognize this as Pier, uh, Pier 39 in San Francisco. And this phenomenon Originally, these were boat slips, you know, the city was making lots of money off people bringing their boats in there. And sea lions kind of discovered it, they followed food up to that area, and then they thought, oh, well, look at these great flat platforms, we can just sleep on these and sun ourselves, this is great. And they started taking them over, and, and um, the city couldn't really do much. I mean, there's, there's a lot of laws protecting California sea lions, and you're not allowed, you know, to shoot them or other things. They tried harassing them, it had no effect really over time. And finally, they realized, with all these tourists who were now eating in these restaurants and buying stuff, that it was a big boon for the tourist industry. And so they basically turned these over to sea lions. And it's a huge tourist straw. Um, so that was kind of a, an interesting transformation, sort of, between a problem that then became an economic um, solution. Um, some of these others are, are just some interesting wanderings of animals. Um, sometimes they just wander up rivers and they end up, you know, these, they might be sick or they might just 
you know, sometimes in the fog, surprisingly, they can get turned around and end up someplace they shouldn't be. Um, interactions with people diving and swimming is becoming a bigger problem. They are curious and they will approach swimmers. If any of you are divers, you know that they'll come right up to you and they'll grab your fins and they'll blow bubbles. And, and most of the time they don't hurt people, but they, they have had some trouble in, in Baja in Mexico with, anim with a couple animals actually biting people. So um, that's a potential problem for safety, certainly. And then we have property damage, um, which is a pretty big issue in Monterey Bay and other um, harbors along, particularly up as you kind of move north up the coast. Um, they have sunk boats, actually, um, because once one animal gets up on there, everybody else comes. It's a, they like to be together. Um, and so they actually have done a fair amount of property damage. And we are working on ways to, to prevent this. We've given boaters some ideas on how they can keep them from getting up onto their boats. Um, but once they've established something like this, basically you can't use that boat. I and mean, they make it stink to the point where you, you wouldn't want to be on it. So it is, um, it is an issue. And, and as, a, you know, as a management agency, we're trying to find ways to, to mitigate that interaction. But it's difficult. I mean, the animals are looking for places to haul out. They follow the food, and wherever the food, food kind of uh, aggregates, they will look for places to haul out. Um, and, and as long as they can find nice platforms like that, they'll be there. So those are some of our probably biggest challenges, I think, in the future as the population continues to grow, is um, sort of mitigating these types of interactions and, and finding solutions that are good both for people and for the animals. So just to kind of summarize all of that, because there's a lot, um, we don't think competition between the species is going to be